Hey, good morning, everybody. This is Stacy, Stacy Plaskett. Um, thank you all for coming and joining us on Facebook Live. And today I've got an incredible guest with me, a good, good, good friend of mine, a wonderful woman, a wonderful American who's going to come and join us in a little bit. Her name is Ayanna Presley. But I wanted to talk with you guys about a couple of things that are happening in the Virgin Islands that went on this week and that I think everyone should be focused on. So first, um, <clears throat> we know that Congress uh, enacted laws that created funding for small businesses. And in the last go round, we tried to narrow the focus so that uh, those businesses that are smaller, that are from uh, represent regional banks, uh, community development um, institutes could have funding to support communities like ours. I'm happy to say that over a thousand businesses in the Virgin Islands received support from SBA in both of these go rounds. That includes the payroll protection program as well as the economic injury disaster loan. That is phenomenal for us and for our size, I wanna thank the banks in the Virgin Islands that really went out there and supported. And thank you to the nonprofits who are, and the accountants who rolled up their sleeves and said, we're just gonna get this to these businesses because they are vital to our economy. I think that this really showed us, um, and this pandemic has showed us the changes that we need to make in our, the Virgin Islands regarding our own society and what drives our economy. We cannot, and I, I'm telling you, I said this the first time I ran, and it continues to be a point to me. We cannot rely on tourism as our economic driver. That is too uh, dependent on the vagaries of the other people's economies, on disposable income that Americans may have and Europeans may have, dependent on uh, what is happening in terms of weather as we saw after the hurricanes and now after other types of disasters like this pandemic. It is important that we put in uh, support to small businesses, to entrepreneurs, to various diversification of our economies, not only that our economy can thrive, so that we can also ensure that there is not this tremendous brain drain on our economy, where uh, Virgin Islanders, young Virgin Islanders go up to the States, they gain skills, and there's no business there for them to be able to take care of. Hey, Charlene, it's good to see you and happy Mother's Day to you. And my condolences to you on the loss of, of Aunt Lou. Um, I feel that very deeply. Charlene uh, grew up with me in New York, but her family is from Rattan. Shout out to the Hewitts in Rattan. Um, her grandmother, Drusilla Brooks, Drusilla Hewitt Brooks, her husband was from St. Thomas, always took care of us, fed me many a meal, both my mother and father and me, uh, for many years in Brooklyn, New York. Just want to give them a shout out. Um, the other thing I want to recall is that today is nurse, this week, past week was nurses, as well as teacher appreciation. And in this pandemic, we have seen the importance of nurses who are on the front line. And let me tell you, as a mother, I know the importance of teachers. Uh, if I didn't know it as well as I did before, I know it now. Having two young people at home who are still um, not at college ages yet and having to support them in their work. And I just wanna give a shout out to them. Uh, the teachers, those of you who are doing the online work, who make yourselves available to young people off hours as well, thank you. Thank you for the service you do to our economy. Um, and, you know, as you'll hear in my PSA this week, teachers and nurses, the first teachers and nurses in each of our lives were our mothers. So happy Mother's Day. Um, so let me now bring up my guest, um, uh, Ayana Presley. Hey. Hey. You look Thank awesome. You. Thank you, sis. I, I wanted to be, um, how are you? It's great to be with you. Thank you for the invitation. And I, I just wrapped a, um, I was just on a Ali Belshi show on MSNBC. So I, 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 I wanted to come and, you know, my statement t-shirt and my jeans too. So you have to have me, have me back on when I can be sitting in my comfy chair and doing that too. So, right, right. Yeah. What's the thing behind you? Oh yeah. It's Shirley Chisholm. Shirley. Yeah, Shirley Chisholm. 
Who so do I, you have? Have, I don't have a statement t-shirt, but I have a statement painting. And oh. then I have, I love statement coffee mugs. So I do have that. This is a tribute to my husband. Hold on. What is it? What does it say? Oh, <laughs> I can't tell you what his says. <laughs> <laughs> I, my um, statement mug, since it's Mother's Day, this is a mug that my youngest oh, son, Israel, right. made when he was in first grade. And he's now going to senior year of high school. So he wouldn't be happy if I showed this, which is why I am. I love it. I love it. For Mother's Day, right? Yeah, I love it. So, you know, Shirley Chisholm, that to me is the quintessential member of Congress, right? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, she was there on the, the first African-American um, member, female member of Congress. She stood up for women, stood up for African-Americans, stood up for the underserved, those who didn't have a voice. And she was getting it, Ayana, from um, but not just both sides of the aisle, but right within her own, you know, the men and even the brothers weren't too happy about uh, some of the things that she yeah. did. That's right. Well, I've always felt, um, I mean, she doesn't just belong to me, but it felt like that when I was growing up because, um, you know, my mother, may she rest in peace and uh, power who raised me alone and I'm an only child. Um, she, she didn't read me like um, nursery rhymes as a bedtime story. She told me, you know, stories of, Freedom Riders and uh, hmm. Black Liberation. And um, so I knew early on about Barbara Jordan and Shirley Chisholm. And I used to go to school in my church suit with fake pearls on trying to mimic them. I mean, so they were they were always heroes to me. And in fact, again, as Mother's Day approaches, thinking about my mother and my mother's uh, final battle with uh, leukemia, she had been, uh, unbeknownst to me, uh, a collect building sort of a, um, a journal, a notebook of things to fortify me. Um, because she knew that she wasn't going to win that battle. I, I did, you know, I was in denial, admittedly. But after she transitioned, I found that. And she had a whole tab that said for inspiration. And when you flip the tab, it was printed speeches from Barbara Jordan and Shirley Chisholm. Wow. And, and now, full circle, um, the office, Longworth, 1108, that I call my office, was Shirley Chisholm's first physical office. Mm. She's been in the house for eight years. She had uh, three different offices throughout that time. My chief of staff had done the research. And so I'm in an office that has a lot of history, good mojo. And yep. so um, uh, we have uh, many, many uh, tributes to Shirley Chisholm, both in Washington, D.C. and here in um, in our home in Boston. And my husband just got that frame for me in time for Mother's Day. So that's so awesome. You know, for me, um, a Caribbean black girl growing up in the yes, I was going to bring that up. That's right. Shirley Chisholm yeah. was everything in our house. And, you know, when Barbara Jordan would speak, you had to be quiet in the house. Um, just that voice, the command with which she utilized yeah. her voice and the English language was just absolutely inspirational. But thank you. Thank, I, I want to thank your husband for not just framing that for you, but, you know, as a member, you know how difficult it is for spouses as well, because he's sharing you with the world, right? Yeah. He and your daughter, how do, how do they handle that? Yeah, well, first I just wanna take a moment, just uh, I hope that your constituents know how fortunate they are to have you as their representative. And I just wanna say, um, as a freshman member, although I'm not, not new to, to politics and governing because I was an elected official before and have been doing this work a long time, I'm new to Congress and to serve on the, um, on the um, oversight committee with you and uh, just to have your mentorship, your sisterhood and your friendship, but also your example. You know, your lines of questioning are always fire. So when you say that when you were growing up, when Barbara Jordan would speak, everyone had to be quiet. That's something my grandmother used to say when it would, uh, when it would be thundering and raining, she would say, everyone be quiet. God is talking, right? Be still, yeah. be quiet. And so um, I, what I will say is we feel very similarly when you speak, <laughs> that Aww. we are all going to be still and we are going to be quiet because uh, we're going to be inspired. We're going to learn something. And so just thank you for your, for your example. Thank and you. so, so far, and also your friendship because, you know, our conversations and our relationship has been very helpful in my navigating this new normal with my family because you've been doing this mm -hmm. and, and your commute is far longer than mine. I'm fortunate in that, you know, I can be home in two hours. Um, but, um, and just 
one flight. You know, I don't have to do a puddle jumper and, a, uh, you know, all the planes, trains and automobiles that you have to do, you know, and, and you do out of a love of service and community. And that's the same reason why I spend five days a week away from my family and um, travel and do all those other things. But, um, you know, they're they're adjusting about as, as well as anyone could. I think if there was any blind spot I had is just how hard I would take it. You know, I've, I've always been doing the work of, of legislating um, in my adult life and in, in my uh, formative years um, on so many campaigns, you know, so community building and movement building work. And it's it is the most rewarding thing. It is the most consuming thing. It can be the most depleting thing. And so I just feel so blessed that I'm at a stage in my life where I have a partner that does not ask me to be an apologist for what is my life's work and my mission. Mm -hmm. And when I'm depleted, pours into me. Mm. And I have that both with my husband, you know, and uh, with our daughter, Cora. Mm. That's so sweet. You know, um, and like I've shared with you, I mean, you know, Jonathan, um, my husband is my second marriage. And I have been through the trial of being in a relationship with someone who, you know, you're doing what you need to do and you're out there and they're with you. And then you get in the car, you get home and they're knocking you down, you know, or they'll be like, oh, they think you're all of that, but they don't know about this yeah. ever. Yeah. And now, you know, to be in such a different relationship with someone who is, um, you know, he's my protector. Right. So uh, he shields me from stuff that bad stuff that people may be saying or tries to shield me from it, but also gives me constructive criticism when I need it, you know, is the filter for people. Oh, yeah, that oh, feedback. Yeah. Yep, yeah. Yeah. Like, absolutely. The circle has stuff to say and it may not be so, you know, so nice. They'll go to Jonathan and they'll talk to him and he'll wait for the right moment to be like, <laughs> yeah. You know, that was, yeah. that was not good. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, my husband's name is Conan, and Conan, I, he's one of my most valued, trusted political advisors. Mm -hmm. And he has said many times before, because he is one of those spouses that never wants to be sidelined. You know, it's not for everybody, and that's okay. Everyone gets to decide how they want to play this. But he made the decision early on that he was going to be all in. And so even though he has his own business and previously served in the mayor's cabinet in a very demanding uh, life, he's been very intentional about showing up and supporting everything from debate prep to holding a sign to um, recruiting volunteers to getting me on the ballot. You know, he's done all of those things. And he's told people so many times before, like, I really believe in what my wife is doing. Even if she weren't my wife, I would be supporting her. I don't know if he'd be going this hard, <laughs> but, you know, but it means a lot to me that I would I would earn his um, his support and his confidence because he's not easy. And that's the other thing about having uh, spouses who we trust in that way is they're a great metric for people that are outside of the bubble. He's very engaged, but he'll, he'll also let me know, you know, hey, that was a lot of word salad and not really like digestible, clear stuff. You know, um, he gives me that constructive feedback and that unconditional love and encouragement all the time. You know, and my daughter and my daughter, too. And my cat. Oh, you have a cat. Yes. Now, listen, everybody in this house is woke. OK, so the cat's name is Sojourner Truth Presley Harris. And we call her Sojo. Sojo. And Sojo or Sojeezy, but Sojo. <laughs> and um, she was actually a rescue cat that my husband gifted me for my birthday several years ago. But the cat only has eyes for my husband. Mm. So, <laughs> so I have a daughter who's a daddy's girl. I have a cat, you know, who's obsessed with my husband. I keep threatening. I'm Listen, I'm going to have a little boy. I need somebody on my side up in here. <laughs> a little so, boy. You know? <laughs> You know, we have, uh, when this whole shut-in started, um, so, you know, I have three sons who are grown. They live out of the house. Um, one's in D.C., one's in New York, one's in Tennessee. But then we have Israel, who is home. And as a teenager, being shut in like that, he was just not having it. He was just, every day it was a discussion about, well, if I go over to Khalil's house, you know, if I sit on the other side of the couch and we, and we're like, no, this yeah. can't happen. 
So I was home um, in the Virgin Islands and I brought up to DC where they are um, a dog from the St. Thomas uh, Humane Society. Wow. Uh, we used to have two dogs. Their name was Liberty and Justice. Uh, they were two Mastiffs. And so now we have a dog. She is a Cane Corso and her name is Queen Kazaya. Um, so Queen Kazaya, <laughs> Queen Kazaya was from St. Thomas and is the queen on St. Thomas, is known as the queen. And she organized the rebellion of the coal workers who were putting coal onto ships. And so she organized them and fought for greater wages and different forms of payment um, for the coal workers, men and women, on St. Thomas. So our dog is named Kaziah, but we call her Cozy. Like I said, I always learn, I always learn something from you. You know, but that's one of those those history lessons that you just offered that I'm, you know, I'm always um, I feel robbed that I don't know that. Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so, so in the Virgin Islands, you know, we really uh, pride ourselves that the Virgin Islands and Haiti are the only two places in the Western Hemisphere that won freedom through violent overthrow. Yeah. So that is always, you know, we feel like we're like Haiti also, that we're still paying the price for that. Yeah. <laughs> well, listen, I, I know that about Haiti because I represent the Massachusetts 7th Congressional District, um, which includes the third largest concentration of Haitian Americans in the country. A lot of people don't know that. We actually have a, a large percentage of, of black immigrants here in, in my district, um, but they're dominated uh, by the Haitian American um, community, very proudly represent them. And in fact, we boast the only dual language Haitian Creole school uh, in the country. Yes, Toussaint Louverture. Mm. When is the movie going to come out about him? That's what I'm I I like. don't know. I don't. But, you know, listen, I, I've been encouraged of late that we're seeing, you know, more movies uh, that are telling our full American history. Mm -hmm. So what? Um, or you, our true global history. So are, have you had a chance to watch any movies? So like you, um, don't let anyone uh, let you think that because we are not physically in Washington that we are not working. We are teleworking and we are on marathon Zoom calls and teleconferences and briefings with our caucus and with our committees. Um, and so uh, usually how this goes is my husband is working on you know his business in his corner and we're so blessed that we have space so that we can separate in that way and, and not hear each other's voices and have that distraction. Our daughter will be doing Zoom school. Shout out to her. She got straight A's this quarter and two A pluses, one in Spanish, one in science. Very proud of her. Um, and then I'll be, you know, in my space. And then uh, at around seven o'clock, we sort of reconvene <laughs> and check in. How's your day? You know, what happened? And we make dinner together and then we sit down and we watch something. So uh -huh. last night, I know people are gonna just say, how is this possible? But I had not seen The Lion King. Which one? The most recent one. Okay, okay, I haven't okay. seen it. Oh my goodness. So we watched that together and um, you know, we're very, I'm a, my, my daughter and my husband are both Cancerians and I'm an Aquarian. So we're, we're criers, we're, we're emotionally, um, we have a high EQ, emotionally, you know, Deep, very accessible people. So there was a lot of tears. Uh -huh. <laughs> I don't think we cried that much since um, the movie Coco. Your kids are older, so you don't watch these. Right? I watch Coco. Okay, well, I, have Coco. Coco. I, mean, I have a 10 year old at home. Okay, right. Oh, right. That's right. Okay. So, um, and then I'll tell you another movie that we watched as a family that we really enjoyed. So, on the comedy side, the movie Little, have you seen that? Yes. With very good. Mm -hmm. Very fun. Yes, we love that. And then um, we watched the Madam G, C, uh, C. J. Walker. Lovely. We yes. The whole we family. We love that. Yeah. Yes. You know what? Um, I was watching with the boys. Um, the one that's in D.C. and my oldest and my husband was the Evolution of Hip Hop. Have you oh, seen? Oh, I haven't seen that. Okay, I'll check that out. Amazing Netflix. It's a series, but it talks about the different stages of hip hop. And I told my son that I remember in 1978, I had the index card. Remember those index cards? Yes. You ran on index cards? Yes, and I still really use those. out invitations. And I had an index card uh, invitation to Sedgwick Avenue in the Bronx 
um, for a, 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 a battle. Because what usually would happen was two people would be battling for DJ equipment and the winner would get the other person's equipment. And all of this changed when the uh, blackout happened in New York and people acquired additional equipment and that's how <laughs> it up. Yes. But in the beginning, you know, it would be the battles yes. of the DJs and my card, my index card was a battle for uh, with Cool Herc and someone else for DJ equipment and said, oh, wow. 79. Look at that, all that history, all that history. When people talk about when, you know, when you know when the out. Have you been watching um, the ESPN docuseries on The Last Dance on Michael Jordan? No, I haven't. Okay. Um, I know this sounds really bad, but I'm not really a Michael Jordan fan. You're not really what, a Michael Jordan fan? <laughs> I mean, I think he is an amazing. I grew up in Chicago, so that's you know that's where I'm originally from. So that's my now, that's my era. Amazing. No, no, no. The, the film has laid bare, um, mm -hmm. has elevated a lot of people's sort of frustrated. It's exposed some of those things that disappointed and frustrated folks for a long time, especially Black folks. Um, so my, that is my, my lack of being all in for him is his social consciousness. Yeah, and yeah, that's what, yeah. It's very, you know, I think about, um, what was it? You, what was the, the, the press conference in the 60s with um, um, when Cassius Clay became um, Muhammad Ali and remember the other athletes who were around him? Was that Seneca or I, I can't remember. I know what you're talking about. Right. And thinking about those athletes who put it out there on the line, one of whom in that picture is Maxine Waters' husband. That's right. I'd forgotten about that. Okay. Yeah. I, was but I do awesome. think that there's been a resurgence, you know, where we see right now, and I would say in recent history, more athletes, more entertainers that are honoring that old tradition or honoring that history mm -hmm. of people who were foot soldiers who use their platform as athletes and artists and entertainers, you know, people like Ozzie Davis and Ruby D and, oh and Harry Belafonte and uh, Belafonte and Sidney Poitier, you know, these were all, uh, um, Lena Holm, you know, they were all very, very conscious, very engaged. And, um, and I think that there are some folks now that are doing, in that same thing, you know, so, and we need them, you know, because what we're seeing in the midst of COVID-19, you know, these inequities and these disparities, these racial disparities that are playing out, both when it comes to who's contracting COVID-19, who's suffering the most severe consequences, and also who's accessing uh, the much needed resources to economically recover, those entrenched inequities existed long before COVID-19, and they've only been exacerbated in this moment. And so, you know, um, I love Rashad Robinson, who I recently did from Color of Change, and we did an op-ed together. And he always says that, you know, racial justice is in charity, it's strategy. Mm. And, I know, and I know you share that sentiment, you know, as well. And so um, we need everybody to, right. to continue to shine a spotlight on these injustices and to demand more because um, we contribute so much and equity and racial justice must be central to everything. And that's actually why this week, Senator Harris and I introduced um, uh, Saving Our Street, SOS legislation to specifically uh, benefit those businesses in the midst of COVID-19 and recovering beyond that are just too small to fail. Our restaurants, our beauty salons, our barber shops, our bodegas um, who have not we did see some increases in who's accessing the funds based on the work that, you know, we've been championing our efforts to have CDFIs and MDIs included in the last relief bill, but it, it's still not meeting the scale of the hurt. And so we need to meet the scale of the hurt with urgency, you know, um, focus on impact and focus on equity. And so we I hope that our legislation gets closer. Right. So it's a hundred, it's $124 billion in a, a micro uh, business grant assistance fund. And that's the key word, grant, not loan. It's nothing you have to pay back. It's right. capped at about 200 at $250,000. And then uh, it's also 
um, the fund is run in such a way that it's priority. It's 75% of the funds must go to those businesses that have been historically underrepresented, struggling to access capital, which historically has been minority owned businesses. And then the other thing that's so key is that it requires reporting um, on racial demographics, on industry, on age, on gender, because even though we've seen these statistics thrown around in terms of who's accessing, and some experts this week said 90% of minority businesses have not benefited, it's, it's anecdotal, it's what we're seeing on the ground, but we need the real data. And we haven't had, the treasury was not providing that transparency in real time. The only reason we know that Ruth Chris and Steakhouse and Pop Bellies uh, benefited from PPP is because they're publicly owned companies. Right. So we need the data because that which gets measured gets done. And that gives us the transparency and the accountability metrics to make sure that in the way that the hurt is being felt by everyone, that the relief is being felt by everyone. Awesome. Awesome. Um, outside of the pandemic, are there any other issues that you are feel you champion um, in Congress outside of the pandemic. You mm -hmm. know the thing is, that, yeah. You know, here's the thing: is that I ran for Congress on the premise that in the district that I now have the honor of representing, which I began in as an unpaid intern 20 plus years ago, so it's very surreal, very humbling. It is a very diverse, dynamic, vibrant district, um, and one of the most unequaled in the country. Stacey, so in a three mile radius from Cambridge, which everyone knows, because that's where Harvard and MIT uh, reside, to Roxbury, which is the blackest part of my district, life expectancy drops by 30 years and median household income by $50,000. So the work that I'm doing in the midst of COVID-19 has just only more acutely right. laid to bear and highlighted the very inequities and racial disparities that sent me to Congress in the first place. And so, you know, one of the things that I'm, some of the things that I'm proudest of having uh, introduced since I've been there, my people's justice guarantee resolution to radically reimagine our criminal legal system, um, my Healthy Mommies Act to address the black maternal mortality crisis. Um, also, um, some of the work that I've done on the Financial Services Committee around our student debt crisis, which is a $1.6 trillion uh, crisis. Um, choking at the promise, you know, of our our communities and disproportionately impacting black households because we borrow more than anyone. We default more than anyone. And that has everything to do with the policies like redlining, unequal access to the GI Bill. And I could go on that have obstructed our abilities to build generational wealth in the same way. So we borrow more, we default more, we're preyed upon by, by private loans as well. And so that's why I continue to push for the canceling of student debt, because this will make a, a sizable dent in addressing the racial wealth gap, because yeah. the average borrower has about $30,000 of debt. And so if you just cancel that bill, then those are funds that they can invest in something else, maybe the, the, the startup uh, equity to own a home, uh, to start a family, um, you know, uh, so that we are passing along instead of gener intergenerational, uh, you know, trauma and poor public health outcomes and cycles repeating generational wealth. And so I really do think the part of any economic recovery of COVID-19 is something we should have done a long time ago. We need to cancel student debt. That's awesome. That's awesome. I, you know, one of the things that's really important to me here is uh, something that you work on on the Financial Services Committee is affordable housing. Uh, and I know how important that is, not just to poor families, but to working middle class families as well. Uh, I grew up in public housing, and that afforded my family not just the ability for my education to have, but also for the to be able to save, own a home, that then they were able to leverage for my education. Or to, you know, my parents uh, living in New York from the Caribbean supported about five other people going to college as well. Um, and I know that families uh, want to do that. And so, you know, I really applaud the work that you were doing on the Financial Services Committee in terms of uh, housing as well, because I think that that is key um, to uh, people eventually being able to do something different, you know, to gain that generational wealth that you're talking about uh, in Absolutely. their 
-hmm. Well, and also I'm not at all surprised that that's the stock that you come from and what your family did. That's that's very consistent with who you are. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and, you know, housing is everything. You know, yeah. it's not only about social and economic mobility and wealth building. Housing is your most expensive bill. It is. It's also a critical it's a social determinant of health. You know, whether you have access to housing that is safe and affordable um, directly impacts whether or not you're more likely to have a higher incident of asthma and things like that. It's all these things are interconnected. And that's really how I try to legislate, because mm -hmm. people don't live in check boxes. We don't live in silos, you mm -hmm. know, so we have to legislate in a way that's intersectional as well. Good, good. Well, I don't want to keep you much longer. I know you got a busy schedule. I saw that you were going to be on Ali Velshi, and you know, I think he's he's doing phenomenal work. I yes, love him. He he's very pointed. I think he's fair, um, very objective. So thank you for being on that show with him. Um, any advice? What are you going to do for Mother's Day? Oh, okay. So what are we going to do for Mother's Day? I'm just going to, I have to be transparent. My husband is going to give me a pedicure. Yeah. Nice. Yes. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to do the whole thing. Breakfast in bed by the family. Nice soap bubble bath. My husband's going to give me a pedicure. Um, we're going to do some power walking together, you know, in the morning as well. And then I will go to my mother's uh, final resting place and, and lay some flowers and spend some time with her. Um, as well, and um, that that that'll really be what we're doing. We usually walk in a uh, we do a Mother's Day peace walk to wow. support mothers who have been robbed of their children due to gun violence, mm -hmm. and so that's usually our tradition as a family. But obviously, because we're all having to uh, physically distance in the midst of COVID nineteen, that isn't happening this year. But we're going to participate in some way virtually. So, what are you going to do? Um, this afternoon, I am going to um, clean my grandmother's graves. Okay. I scrub them down, rake them out, repaint them um, to thank those women, you know, who created my parents and created me. I've already sent my mother a plant. Um, she doesn't like flowers. She likes plants. She's a plant woman. Uh, and then on Sunday, tomorrow, Jonathan and I are going on a boat. We're going to go see. This is the benefit of living in paradise. We're going to go to Buck Island on a small boat, just the two of us. Oh, you know, my goodness. Water, do some snorkeling, um, hang out at the beach, eat some food. And then oh, go. my goodness. That sounds, that's the perfect Mother's Day. You do something that is, so we honor our ancestors, those who came before us. You're right. doing something that is memorable, making a memory, and mm -hmm. you're doing something restorative and indulgent. That is perfect. Perfect. And you deserve it. Yeah. So happy Mother's Day, you know, to all happy of Mother's Day to you. To you. I wanna, you know, you you have always talked about coming down when this yes. we have the ability. I want you and the family to come down because we've got some stuff for you to do as well let's as your, your daughter as well. Yeah, this, let's do it. You know, we are still, thankfully, a society where children are still free range here. Mm -hmm. um, and the elders in the community watch out for them. I'll just tell you one story. So mm -hmm. when I worked in town, in one of our towns in Fredericksburg, my, um, one of my, when my child was small, I think it was like in the first grade, would walk to my office. And I got a call from one of our elders that my son had not said good afternoon to her. And uh, you know, I was amazing, uh, you know, knew better, and my child needed to have better manners. And wow. Well, that is that is the true modeling of it takes a village. Right, okay? right. So, so you come great. down and you know, we'll do some amazing things. And I do want to visit you in Boston because you have an amazing community with so many Caribbean people, Africans, and then people from so yeah. many other different cultures. It's it's amazing. Yeah, we'll definitely roll out the red carpet. It would be, you know, I would love I would love to host you and we look forward to getting to VI and um, it was great being able to chat with you. And um, next time we'll talk about books. I, I forgot to talk about literature today. Yes. You know, you're reading? Yeah, I'm reading a book called um, Leadership in Unprecedented Times. <laughs> so uh, by Doris Kearns Goodwin, a, a local artist. And I read a lot of poetry. 
history. I read a lot of um, Nikki Giovanni. Yeah, Nikki Giovanni, Sonia Sanchez, Audre Lorde, you know, so I, just, I do that all the time. I understood Nikki Giovanni and Angela Davis were on Facebook Live. Today. I heard that. I don't know what marathon Zoom thing that or caucus thing that we were on that we missed that. Right. So I have to go. I have to go back and, and watch watch the tape. So, but uh, I just finished rereading, and it's uh, almost a day read. Was Chinua Achebe's A Man Apart, which oh, was, I read some of the reviews of that. Okay, I'll add that to my list. When okay. do you usually read in the morning? Um, I read read late at night. Right, late at night. Yeah, with, that's with your readers on. I, you know, I always have them. Yes, you always have I can't, those readers. I can't yes. do the thing without them. Yeah. <laughs> well, you make them look very cool, just to be clear. You know. Thank you. So, thank Love you so you. much again for having me. Miss Love you. Take care. All right. Thank Talk you. to you. Bye, everyone. Thank Bye. you.